Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nishat Sauturian, and I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. Our guest this week was David Bardasarian, the co-founder and CEO of Crisp. He joined us to discuss how his startup has grown to be a leader in the voice productivity AI space. He shared with us his thoughts on AI product development in the age of large AI models and what the newest developments are in the field of voice AI. David also spoke about his journey of founding Big Story VC, an early stage venture capital fund in Yerevan. Lastly, we spoke about Bazumk, a nonprofit space research lab where David is an advisor. Thank you for listening. David, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for inviting. So there's a few things I want to talk to you about today. One of them is AI product development in 2023. And I want to look at that a little bit through the lens of Crisp. But first, I think it's been six years now that since you guys launched Crisp about that. So I wanted to maybe just take a second to, to reflect on that. It's quite a mature product now with tens of thousands of users. Take us back to just sort of the beginning of Crisp and let's go through the sort of the product's journey, the evolution of product. What did it look like when it first launched? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Look, I mean, it all started with an idea to apply we called machine learning, you know, six years ago, we didn't right. call it AI. It was a bit embarrassing to call it AI, <laughs> call it deep learning or machine learning. So we, the idea was to apply machine learning to the problem of noise cancellation and hopefully have results, right? It was a very you know, open-ended idea by that time. And um, there was some work in the academia, uh, published work, but nothing beyond that. So very like early results. And the team that we gathered here in Armenia, they had like no audio experience uh, whatsoever, right? They were mathematicians, right? Background in physics or math. So like the original team, they needed to learn machine learning, right? which was not as hyped and accessible as it is these days. And also apply very complex math, which is, you know, the digital signal processing, and everything related to it. So basically two difficult disciplines, DSP and machine learning, combine them together to have some results. So, you know, like, honestly, like the first probably two years of the company, we have been trying to uh, create a production ready technology, right? Early on when we, when we just started, the idea was to integrate this technology into different apps like Zoom, Twilio. I was coming from Twilio, right? And we were having these difficult conversations with these companies. There was some interest, but because voice is a critical infrastructure, nobody wants to touch it, right? It was like, and, and then like this would need to go in and be integrated into this infrastructure. That was a difficult sort of conversation and the technology wasn't there yet. There were a lot of challenges for us. And so early on, this was all about like figuring out what machine learning is, figuring out how to solve this problem in terms of data collection. Where do you get data for like noise data, right? And one interesting thing we did, which was, I think, very smart and uh, impactful, we found out that in movie industry there is a lot of noise like noise data because when you do like movie editing you can add some noise like different sort of sounds mm -hmm. like they didn't call it noise it was sound like different sounds so we use that data for uh, synthesizing noisy speech and so on pretty much like that didn't change today like you if you want to have a model you need to have data and you right. need to have a neural network a lot of things are more accessible but pretty much like the cycle didn't change uh, like if you're creating a new model mm -hmm. you said the first two years you guys were in the development phase so did it take two years to launch a product yes we yeah. we, we launched the company officially in 2017 october but i mean before that almost a year there was like research going on right and then we launched the product in june 2019 mm -hmm. like officially launched it actually like we brought it to product hunt in 2018 but just like before bringing it like the tech wasn't ready yet it was a matter of just weeks when our research team did a breakthrough like in terms of quality so mm. it was that's how startups work it's like all last minute but it right. happens if there is enough focus and effort right. being put right so but yeah it, it took us at least two yeah. years in your role at Twilio before, were you a software engineer or a machine learning engineer? I was neither of these. Like my background is software engineering, but right. when I joined Twilio, 
even like before Twilio, I started doing a lot of security engineering, mm -hmm. right? So like cryptography, cryptography like the real, right. the real <laughs> cryptography. Yeah, and uh, authentication systems and so on. I have like a very interesting previous life before CRISP, right? Even before Twilio. But when I joined Twilio, I joined their security team. Mm -hmm. So I was responsible for product security at Twilio, right? Right. for all the product lines. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I remember you saying in one of the interviews you gave shortly after you guys raised your Series A was that in order to grow from like this seed stage company that has you know a product with maybe some one feature or some limited features to something that really scales and is able to attract investment is that you have to be able to present sort of the bigger picture, right? And it seems like CRISP has really developed into something that is in some ways more comprehensive than just noise cancellation. And recently you guys announced CRISP 2.0 and the, the features that have, have come with it. Some of them are like transcription and summarization, things like that. And then you guys have this really interesting accent localization feature that you announced. Before we dive into those features, first I'm curious about, so you have this product with this really useful utility, this feature. How do you think about what complements it? Like, because it's easy to fall into the trap, I think, of just adding stuff that maybe looks good, but it kind of starts to like remove the focus on the core functionality of the product. How do you decide what's useful to add? Let me just address the first part of the sort of the question or statement that you made about like the bigger vision, right? Yeah, like noise cancellation uh, is not a big vision by itself, right? It's a, it's clearly a feature. And as a company, we have struggled with that, right? Uh, I always say this internally, like unlike other like more proper companies, like businesses when they are formed, like they usually form the product. I mean, they have the product idea and then they come up with the technology. For us, it was the opposite. Like we had a technology, very universally applicable technology. We didn't know what product it's going to be, right? Mm. <laughs> and that's still like evolving uh, in a sense. But I think like a voice, like the category we are in right now, we call it voice productivity. It's such a big category. There is so many things you could do to make people more productive when they do, you know, when they are having voice conversations that uh, it's pretty big. And, and yes, so that's like, a, like independent what stage you are in usually you need to have a big picture mm -hmm. and big vision. Otherwise, it's it's hard for investors to invest because their logic is that like you need to become a big company, otherwise they wouldn't invest, right? But coming back to your second part of the question, which is how do we prioritize? The prioritization is what is the key, right? And it's the most difficult thing, I think, in business, right? And it's not only about product, but it's about everything. Like you always have a lot of options and uh, you need to apply your best judgment to, or like data driven, be data driven. I mean, utilize different inputs and then make a judgment call to, for the prioritization. So um, that's not different for product features as well. So like, yeah, of course, like if I, I can name you like 10 different things that we could be, or even more, right? That we could be building, but every like different thing is a different, it's a very different journey for it would put crisp into a very different right. journey right from market perspective segment perspective audience and so on uh in particular how we do this stuff is we you know like we are let's say we are we have a lot of traction in call centers we go to call centers and say and and see what what are the important things for call centers we talk to them we think about this all the time of course it's not about only like understanding what's important for them. The other question is, do you have a good fit to solve that or basically looking into the competition and the market, right? We thought that because our strength and superpower is like doing real time voice audio transformation on device, like mm -hmm. on user's device, which is very, very unique to CRISP, right? right. The way I formulate it, there are only like few companies are doing this and crisp i think is the best in that right in its capability so we thought that accent uh, localization would be uh, a great next thing for us so we started working on that and there was some there was already some market validation for this so we started working on this uh, some time ago and we have some amazing results because that's a strength we have right but yeah, so like the product strategy is very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult sort of endeavor. 
Tell us what exactly accent localization is. Yeah, sure. So in real time, the technology uh, localizes or translates is a better word, I guess, to uh, the, the speaker's accent to the listener's hmm. accent for better comprehension and understanding. Hmm. Right. So, like, let's say, uh, so it's it's mostly applicable. Uh, we think it's mostly applicable in call center. Uh, not only, but like it has a high demand in call center uh, market. And so imagine um, a call center in India. Uh, they always are in a search for agents that have great communication skills and expertise. But uh, accent is barrier, right? Like, like similar, like language is a barrier. Mm -hmm. Accent is a barrier as well. So there are a lot of great potential like to be agents who are not able to participate in the right. economy, find jobs, but they could if there was a technology such as CRISPS that would uh, remove that barrier, right? So, like, call centers would have more flexibility to hire people from around the world. Because so, if I'm technology. speaking to a non-native English speaker and they're using CRISPS accent localization, I would hear their voice in a maybe like an American English accent, yeah, for yeah, example, exactly. and stuff. Yeah, and so it would be easier and you would just understand them better. Mm, right. That's a super interesting use case. I'm trying to think of like what the data collection and pipeline for that would look like, and it's bringing up a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> Tell us about the transcription services that you guys also launched recently. Yeah, yeah. So we have spent a lot of time actually on this. Again, like our strength and differentiator really is that whenever we do voice technology, voice AI, we do it um, on device. Okay, so that this is very, very unique. But the data is not sent back to like CRISP servers or something yeah, to be processed. I mean, it's all done some data it. might be sent. The voice audio data is never sent, right? So there are a lot of tons of transcription services out there in the world, right? By the way, that's a pretty expensive service. Like it's expensive because you not only need to run like big, you know, neural networks and GPUs, but you need to process a lot of audio data and store it, you know, process. It, it just makes, it means that you need a lot of server and, and network bandwidth to do that. And uh, the way we did this is we, we did it on end user's device. So basically when you use CRISP, transcription happens on your device, which means that not only CRISP doesn't see your voice audio data, but also like uh, we don't spend any server resources mm -hmm. to process this, right? Everything happens, like we basically outsource the processing cost to users machines which gives us a lot of benefits compared to the market such as a pricing disruption right so as i said like it's pretty expensive stuff today for us it's free so we can be highly flexible if we didn't crisp app actually transcription is entirely free mm -hmm. it's within the free plan like anyone can just download and start this is a this is a revolution nobody does that right, right? for meetings. And the second one is like, yeah, it's definitely more privacy because voice audio is, is not sent, which is a biometric data. Um, but also it, it just, it does enable other things such as better UX and, you know, not, ha not having to include like bots mm -hmm. so that they record your meeting and right. transcribe it. Like this is an amazing user experience. So the transcription is done on device as well. And then you guys also had a summarization yes. feature that goes in with that? Yeah, for summarization, we have to use cloud services. There is basically no summarization technology that works well that can run on device. Right. Because uh, these models are pretty large. And um, yeah, it's just not possible to do it on device unless you have like huge GPU, which our users don't have, right? So like we do send the transcription of the But not the audio. To our cloud. Mm -hmm. And then we do uh, the summarization there. Right. Interesting. When looking at um, sort of the last seven months in the world of AI, obviously the biggest thing has been accessibility to really powerful LLM APIs, large language model APIs. And this has sort of brought out a new set of features for a lot of companies that have really rushed to integrate those AI capabilities into their products, whether or not they were AI companies before or not. So I guess like summarization and for Crisp's case could be one such feature. Uh, other Armenian companies like Softer have, have also integrated LLM features into their products. But at least on my end, I've seen less sort of from scratch startups being built just around functionality that an LLM's API can 
deliver. You mean like building LLMs? Not building LLMs, but building a product that is based on features that you can get from an API that some LLM provider provides, right? Like GPT or... Oh, you mean in Armenia you have seen less? Because in the world, there are like plenty of these, right? Every day, like... So even in, the, <laughs> even in the world though, like, like for example, like when GPT-3 first came out and it was limited in terms of like its accessibility, not many people had access to the APIs. There's some really successful, like at least from a fundraising perspective, companies built like Jasper and Copy AI. But at the time it was still really hard to access those APIs. So they had some defensibility that they had access to the APIs and others didn't. Today, it could be argued that it's much easier to replicate those products that were built in the GPT-3 day, which was like 18 to 24 months ago. So I guess what I mean is like just building like a, a product solely around um, something that is using right? someone else's API. Yeah. I'm sure it's happening, but like, do you think there's a path forward to building like defensible companies like this? Or, or will it mostly be benefited from companies like Chris, which already have a great product and a lot of users that they can just add more features for? I don't think anything changed has changed in the world, right? So whenever a technology, a new technology such as disruptive as the GPT, uh, you know, uh, is available, you know, everyone has access usually to it, right? Uh, that's usually the case. And, and that's becoming more the case as time progresses. Like maybe in the past, someone could, you know, just hide it, you know, not make it available. But we have seen that. Uh, yeah, OpenAI did a breakthrough, but I mean, the, even like the open source community is so after them right now, yeah. right? Uh, even Google is uh, worried that the open source is going to win uh, this race. So, I mean, like, it's really difficult to uh, have a technology. It's called moat, right? right? As your moat. So, uh, I mean, again, like, it's sometimes it's possible. In case of CRISP, actually, this is very interesting. We don't know why this happened, but. Um, for like, even like these days, there is no a decent open source noise cancellation out there, right? Which is, I think, quite remarkable. Like we thought it would be earlier, uh, but it's probably because the, the problem of noise cancellation is not that big because mm. it's pretty clear that if that was like top of mind, like people would just do it as, in, as we see in case of GPT. So like technology as a mode is, uh, it's difficult, uh, but there are other modes, and there has there have always been other modes, right? Like network effects, right? Uh, there are like probably seven such modes, and brand could be a mode. Usually, this it's your market reach, or like in other words, it's the distribution, right? So let's say Google has an amazing distribution; they have the access to billions, or or let's take like Facebook and Instagram, right? They like within five days they had uh, after launching threads they had like 100 million signups right uh, not users but signups but that's like that's that's the distribution like imagine if someone else than instagram did this like how i mean it would need to be so good so noble so like different which threads is not right uh, for for it to have like 100 million signups it would have to be something like G like uh, chat gpt yeah so novel and like different uh, to have so many people. So basically, this, my point is that distribution is the biggest mm -hmm. differentiator that companies have. So uh, it's not like some, some API access or, of course, if you have technology different, I mean, at the end, like, of course, technology matters a lot. It gives you, um, it gives you dif differentiation that others might not have. But what it, the business success boils down to distribution. I don't know if possible is the right word because it sounds too uh, harsh, but like, is it possible for a new startup to have an advantage in distribution? Well, it, yes. I mean, that's the idea of startups. Like you right. need to crack that down, right? So it's hard, but like, if you don't have distribution, it's just, you just can't have a business. Right right. So that's like, that's the hard part. I mean, of course, like building technology is hard as well. Building a team is hard, but that's my point. Like it all boils down to building the distribution. Mm -hmm. So it can be uh, based on partnership. Like you don't have to create that from zero, right? You can go and let's say if you are an app on a platform, the platform might give you a distribution, right? If, if there are enough incentives or uh, that's that we have seen that many, many, many times, right? Or if, if something you have is novel, like a, and has a virality in it, right? Built-in virality and mm -hmm. network effects like Slack, 
or Zoom, or, or if something like Zoom, which is pretty decent, like it always works type of product compared to the competition that also like they're like word of mouth will take you off. Uh, right. That's how crisp was taken off, right? Word of mouth and novelty. Um, so like that's what the biggest energy and effort goes into mm -hmm. in startups. Because again, like at the end of the day, if, even if you have the best technology and no one knows about it, who cares? Right. 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 It's like, I, I always say this to my friends or like startups, it's like, if, even if you have built like the best car in the world, like it's like just amazing and it's in your garage, nobody sees that. You, you always go there, you know, it's nice, I, it's so cool, I did this. Nobody cares. You need to take that, you know, drive through the city, yeah. <laughs> do the marketing so that people see that right. and somehow start, you know, the word gets out there. Right, right. Let's speak a little bit about voice AI a little bit more generally. Um, so we we hear a ton these days about language models and before that generative AI for artwork and images and stuff had really taken off with Dolly and, and stable diffusion and stuff. Voice AI we hear about, but less so than those two right now. What's new in the world of, of voice AI? What's on the horizon? Yeah, sure. So like, look, when we just started, like there wasn't that much of voice AI happening. The noise cancel AI, you know, applied to noise cancellation was perhaps one of the uh, first ones. Actually, I'll take it back. Transcription was probably like the, the first one and, and text to speech text as well, right? Was like before even AI, those were, those were like very important things. But as the AI revolution started, of course, like these are big problems, right? These two Googles and Amazons and everyone basically has put a lot of effort into creating transcription and uh, speech, uh, text to speech technologies. And noise cancellation was uh, like another one that we focused on. Uh, there were some like smaller models here and there, but nothing major was happening. I mean, look, voice is super important. Like it's huge. It's huge. And if you start to like decompose, like what are the technologies, like again, transcription, speech to text, quality, which is like noise cancellation, maybe like voice reconciliation, like when you, when it's broken up and you, you bring uh, the fragments back. So like quality and then translation and accent. I'm not going into like music and stuff, right? right? I'm right. just like focusing on speech in particular. In Gen AI, uh, there is like the idea of generating new voices, right? Or like changing, transforming your voice to, let's say, instead of my voice, it's Brad Pitt's voice. Uh, there is a lot of uh, usage of that in ads, in uh, gaming, right? Uh, so like Crisp is focused on business communication, so that's less relevant there. What's probably going to be next, like the big thing is going to be this large speech model mm -hmm. idea, right? So there is large language model, which sort of is quite universal in terms of what it can do. Uh, then there is the idea of LSM, right? Large speech model, which can do pretty much everything that I just said within a one, within one model, right? Imagine a, a model that can translate, like you give an audio and say like, okay, take this audio, convert the speaker one to like, the, the, remove the accent or like convert the accent of speaker one and then translate to this and then it would like all do that with the highest quality right and so and then you, you would communicate with it with text so that you explain what it needs to do and this model is so um so it, it understands the features of voice so inherently well that is like like in case of gpt4 right mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to explain how it how it does all these things. Right. It's just like you have trained it with so much data that it understands this stuff so well that it can do these transformations way better than individual models could do, mm -hmm. right? Something like that, like people are working on that. Right. As someone in the space, as someone like competing to have a product that is competitive in the space, how do you think about being ready for when models like that emerge to remain competitive? Sure. Yeah. Look, when a model like that comes along, pretty much like nothing will change from our perspective because these models are huge. In case of GPT-4, which is, I think, estimated to have more than trillion parameters, uh, it must run in the cloud, right? And uh, the differentiator of CRISP is that it runs on, on device, edge, right? right? So there are different like things uh, that this will enable. We think that 
given this differentiator, like we need to, after we, we are done with accent technology, we take it, it's successful. The next thing we would go, go and do is like a speech to speech translation on device, right? So it's very, very organic, logical uh, to have something like that in Chris, inside Chris. But I think we can use these models, these large models to derive smaller models that we can run on edge, right? I think like that's one direction that Chris feels very confident about that we can do, right? Things. Because of the expertise you guys have yeah. built up over the last Yeah, year. I mean, I think we have amazing expertise. We have an amazing product that fits very well into this model, right? So that's that's our strength. Let's go and do that. By the way, like one thing that I haven't mentioned, uh, it's quite incredible. Um, so our transcription technology that runs on device, uh, the latest version, which is not inside the app yet, we're going to bring it soon. It has a comparable results to... Are you familiar with Whisper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's Whisper's nice. large model, right? Wow. Which is amazing. Like this is, we are very surprised to see that, those results. So, and it's, it's not something that is just given. Like it's, it's an effort that mm -hmm. we put. Our team is quite amazing in that sense. Like we are able to squeeze from this smaller network so much, you know, quality on device. And, and yes, there is an expertise that is very unique in the world. Yeah, I think it's a great point that as these large models come out, it's one thing to demonstrate that these large models work extremely well, but it's a, it's another thing to get them in users' hands, especially on device. And companies like CRISP are like well positioned to like run data distillation projects and get smaller, well performing models from those large ones and, and really benefit from there. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, at the end, like if you have such large models, you need to be in an API business. Uh, and there are already companies in API doing right. API. So like that's what I mean by saying pretty much like right. nothing will change. Right. Unless it's just like these models are so much better, right? And then like we, we will, obviously we will find a way to either use them or again, like derive sm smaller right. models based on them, right? So that we have a similar level of quality right. on device. Speech to speech translation, what I think I think would be like, in the voice AI space, it would be like the wow moment that kind of the chat GPT was uh, last year and for language. Um, it's an enabling sort of technology for humans. Right? It'll probably it's, be the greatest like communications, bringing down the barrier of communications that has ever existed. Yeah, yeah I don't think like communication ends with that, like sure. the barriers end there. There is way more than that, right? Because, I mean, yeah, you can say things, okay, they will understand, but how effective are you sure. saying this thing? Especially in business, business is important. But yeah, it's, I think translation is just a huge, huge, yeah. huge. For sure. Uh, yeah, technology. So uh, it's been a couple of years now that you guys announced Big Story VC, which is your co-founder, Artavaz, and Podcastle's founder and CEO, Artavaz Venture Fund that you guys launched. Tell us what, what the, not transition, but the new life as a, a venture capitalist has been like for you. I think it's been 18 months that it's formally formed the biggest challenge we have is that we have two R2s in the team, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's confusing. <laughs> it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of a like less traditional VC because the partners, the, all, all the partners are founders, operators, right? So it's like founders fund, right? right? I think that gives us a lot of leverage and also it makes it more attractive for companies to work with us, right? Because uh, we can understand, we have been in their shoes, we, we can understand them so well, and we can therefore help them probably better than others, right? It's a $10 million fund. By the way, like uh, half of that fund has like uh, the LP, like the biggest LP, LP meaning limited partner, which means like An whoever gives us the money, right, for the fund has been an investor at Crisp and Podcastle. Right. right? They are a large international investor. And when I asked them, like, why do you want us to do this? And they said, because we believe in Armenia become, you know, in like a technological boom happening in Armenia. So that was very motivating, right? Yeah, it's a $10 million fund and we do small checks, right? From 100K to 300K in that range. Probably it's like, in average, it's to 25K. We already made 15 uh, investments. And we will probably do another 20 investments over the course of next uh, two and a half years, which, which is amazing, right? So the way we think about our fund is that it's like indexing technology 
ecosystem of Armenia. Of Armenia. And that's how we think about this. Yeah. The scope of the fund is Armenian founders. So at least like one of the founders must be Armenian and uh, hopefully they will have plans with Armenia as well. So these two team, sort of yeah. criteria. All of our companies sort of qualify with to, to those two conditions, right? Uh, I, I think like there is an opportunity to go beyond that. So probably like remove the first criteria, which is one of the founders must be Armenian. Uh, as long as like companies have strong presence in Armenia, I think that's that should we should count for that. But maybe it would be the next fund that we will have. Mm -hmm. We have made fifteen investments, amazing companies. From our perspective, we enjoy this a lot. Like, look, these are these are very early stage investments, right? And it's it's really hard to predict what happens with companies at the early stage. All of them usually pivot, right. or like ninety nine percent pivot. Um, so what we do is we invest in the team, basically in the team and in their capability uh, of uh, doing things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, hopefully technological things. Right. Uh, that's more preferable for us. Yeah, um, like enjoying a lot, actually. We are super excited about Brick Story. What's something you learned as a VC today that you didn't know when you were just a founder? Yeah, like one thing that's very clear, I started understanding VCs better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of things that I wouldn't understand and I would think, you know, they, uh, I don't know, maybe it's unfair or like uh, there is arrogance yeah. or now I understand better because I understand better how the math works and how the the economics of the VC works, right? And how they make decisions. Uh, and so on. I think that's like definitely one big learning that helps uh, at CRISP as well. Yeah, other than that, I definitely learned how to like how other markets work, right? Um, outside of CRISP market, yeah, outside you of like what we have been doing. So, because you need to sort of have a, some framework for assessing whether the idea is good or not, it's going to be big or not. So, you need to have opinion about things which doesn't come just naturally, like overnight, it takes time. Sometimes you're wrong, sometimes you're right. So uh, that's a lot of learning and uh, right. yeah, as I said, we love it. Mm -hmm. It's an awesome story that a mutual investor in Podcastle and Crisp saw the potential in Armenia to and wanted to invest in early stage startups here. Do you think more can be done or should be done to, because most Armenian companies today, most Armenian startups will uh, track their early stage investments at the pre-seed and increasingly the seed stage we see from Armenian venture funds. And then in Series A's from there on are usually attracted from global uh, venture funds. And now we have a number of Series A and even B and C companies uh, in Armenia. Should or could more be done to attract those venture funds to be maybe operating at the early stage level in Armenia or investing in Armenian venture funds to help foster more capital into the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. There is, there is a big gap there, actually. So you could always argue and say, you know, like the best companies can raise from US, uh, which might be true. But I, I think when you think from ecosystem perspective, so like this is something that we need to take into account, right? When a round happens, you know, usually there is a lead investor, right, in the round. And that lead investor needs like a lot of indications, uh, like for forming their opinion about the startup, the opportunity and so on. And a lot of the time, especially in the earlier stage, there can be a lead or there can be a co-lead, right? Uh, this happened a lot with Chris, like an investor from US would say, well, I will lead if there is a, like, I will co-lead if there is another co-lead, hmm. right? So imagine if that co-lead is from Armenia, that is a, is a VC in Armenia that has a deeper understanding of the, of that company and the founders and the team, right? And the culture. And the mm -hmm. culture and opportunity and everything. So, and this VC co-leads and gives that extra points mm -hmm. of confidence to the US investor. This is a very important point, right? And it's very practical, I would say. So by doing this, we can have more companies that are able to raise from US. And when that happens, a lot of other things happen. So the trust for the ecosystem starts growing as it has grown in the last six years, right? If there are VCs here, present here, like uh, international VCs, which is not the case today. That's already incredible. Like 
a lot of VCs have presence in Israel, let's say. They bring more culture, credibility, and all of that. So that's how the ecosystem develops. Right? There is just no other way for it to develop. Right? Right. And we need to develop this ecosystem so that we have more unicorns uh, being born here. And then at some point in the future, there will be so much trust in the ecosystem that after some legal, proper legal frameworks are present and trust is present in the, in the country, only after that companies will register in Armenia, which is probably the, the end goal, right? So that we have true Armenian tech companies that are registered in Armenia that are valued, so, you know, a billion dollar. Uh, but before that, it's just not going to work out, right. right? That's not how it works. You mean registered as in, like, they're legally. not even a Delaware c -Corp? Yeah, like, le legally, why not, right? I mean, there are Israeli companies that are registered in Israel, right? And they are, uh, they, they still get a lot of funding, like, same way in Great Britain, Sweden, Germany, uh, I think Estonia as well. So, but they're even there's... without having a Delaware C Corp, they're yeah, able to raise exactly, venture exactly. funds. There are not many such countries in the world, but mm. you do want the company to stay legally here so that it contributes entirely contributes to the GDP of the country, right? right. Um, yeah, I mean, e even if it's not legally uh, registered here, there is a lot of GDP contribution already happening. Mm -hmm with a side effect, you know, like, because there, there, there are a lot of multiplicative effects here, right? But the ultimate contribution is when it's legally in Armenia and uh, everything, like, everything is contributed to the country. To be honest, I always thought that that was uh, just way too far off of a goal because even if you look at, like, really mature ecosystems, like in Western Europe and stuff, most of the activity is still done through... Delaware C Corps. So it's interesting to hear you bring up examples of like Israel. Well, well the stuff. reason you need Delaware Corp is like for there are two reasons, right? One is that y you need that for U.S. investors. U.S. investors are not going to invest in an Armenian entity. There is just no way for that. But even like an Israeli one, right? Or but well, they do in Israeli because there is so much trust now there. Hmm. What motivates investors is FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. So if there is money to be made in Israel, they will go and, you right. know, right. do the investment. So it's like your ecosystem must be so strong mm -hmm. that there is FOMO for investors. Right. And when there is FOMO, things will happen. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't happen just because, you know, you want so or because, sure. yeah, whatever. So those would be like serious reforms in like business law, judiciary stuff within Armenia so that investors feel yeah really that's not enough that's my point like you yeah. could do these things but it, it wouldn't it wouldn't move the needle right you need to have international presence right. in like vcs here uh, but that for the start, vcs to come they would need those things first right not first that's my point that's the second phase like in the first phase you need in my belief I you see. need like companies like that right. are right. registered in delaware they're operating right. from here right. they become big and then the vc ecosystem yeah. you know it becomes bigger and then only right. after the, the legal framework and system is present and there is enough FOMO, right. these investors will be uh, open to invest directly in Armenia. In Armenia. Right. I want to move on to sort of the third thing that, that you're super involved in, which is Bazunk, but also like sort of helping foster a little space tech ecosystem within the country. We've spoken a little bit about Bazum before in the podcast, but for listeners who might not know, tell us what it is. Yeah, when people ask me what I do, I say like three things, you know, Chris, Big Story and Bazum. And uh, the idea why, right? Like my personal like passion is technology, to, like develop technology ecosystem in Armenia. And like for that, we need great companies, like, you know, which we try Chris to, to make a great company. We need VCs, which is Big Story, and we need new ecosystem, like ecosystems, right, which is Bazunk for space tech. So Bazunk is a non-profit space research lab, right? It's been founded by several incredible people who have been in aerospace in the last 30 years in Armenia. So they have been teaching kids, super passionate people, right? Um, they have been teaching kids, you know, going from school to school. So Aveti Grigorian is uh, one of the founders. He has actually written a book, which is just amazing. It's a book in Armenian. It's about space. And it's 
like I have a copy of that. It's just amazing. And is it like I, a popular science book for everybody to read, or is yes, it like a yes, yeah. I, I think it's limited copies, but it's like the the depth of it mm -hmm. is so incredible, right? There are not probably not, not many books in the world that have this depth. And I actually one of my friends texted me today, and they're from US. They're here, and they said that they want to translate it in English. Yeah, so that's I'm, I'm very, you're very excited about that. Anyway, so. Uh, th that's the founding team. And, and the mission of the lab is to create, to develop the ecosystem for space tech. Like why, why, why is that important? Is because the space economy is growing incredibly fast in the world. It's remar remarkable how little we know about that, right? Like about space and so on. Um, and I, I had to like read a couple of books to understand the importance and opportunity, business opportunity there, and the opportunity for Armenia to be part of this uh, big technological uh, sort of change or transformation. And, and that happened after a couple of things happened in the world. One is SpaceX made uh, like taking a cargo to space 10 times cheaper, mm -hmm. right, over in, in the last uh, several years. So that became, so this low orbit became economically very affordable. And that's how it usually works, you know, when, when it makes sense economically, things start to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of companies, a lot of investments going into companies to, uh, to build technologies for observation, like Earth observation. Like the GPS has been the biggest technological uh, advancements that space made it possible, right? And there's like... The GPS economy is like over trillion dollars now. Now the second thing, the big thing that is coming is the uh, observation, right? Mm -hmm. I think they call it geospatial observation. Um, so that's when uh, you can observe the Earth from the space, create a lot of applications on top of that. So like that's like we want to be part of that. We want to part of that economy. We see a path there, right? So like the lab has done several things in the last three years. But this year is like, super exciting because we are going to send our first domestically developed satellite to low orbit. We're going to do it through SpaceX in November. And it's the first time like Armenian engineers have written code for satellite. They right. did like functional tests. They are integrating, integrating um, a component developed by another lab. It's mm -hmm. a tiny satellite. It's called CubeSat. It's one unit CubeSat. In other countries, you know, these like CubeSats are pretty much like a standard for small satellites. Yeah, so we're gonna send it. It's called Hayasat One, mm -hmm. and actually soon in August we're gonna do a crowdfunding campaign for two reasons: for like one for funding, for like the far further uh, research and development at the lab, but also to create awareness about this because it's mm -hmm. like a historical moment, like. Let's, you know, the more people uh, know, the more Armenians know around the world about this, the better. Yeah, so it's like Bosom is doing like that, but also it's doing something. And that's how I got to know Bosom actually, mm -hmm. is doing model rocketry right. for kids. Yeah. So uh, for those who don't know what, what it is, it's very popular in US. Um, uh, it's, it's a hobby for the kid, where kids create small, like tiny rockets. You send it, you know, like 20, 30 meter up and it cr opens the parachute, mm -hmm. comes back. It can be 100 meters as well. So we, we are running, like Bosom is running uh, model rocketry clubs in four schools now in Armenia. And we are doubling it this year and we're going to do it eight mm -hmm. schools. And then we are introducing advanced model rocketry. So basically, yeah, we have a plan on how to, mm -hmm. you know, create the next generation of rocket yeah. scientists, right? One of my students that I tutor is a part of the model rocketry association oh, yeah? and like the excitement nice. that he talks about and he shows yeah, me the videos yeah. every week of the model. Yeah, the my nephew went, went there and yeah. he was like super excited. Yeah. About it. Uh, There's a lot of retention actually. Kids just like 80% retention, which is incredible yeah. for any like teaching yeah. club, right? Tell us a little bit more about the satellite. What's the, what's its function going to be? Yeah, it's look, uh, so this is like the first time, as I said, we are building a satellite and Really, the, if I were to say like the, the core function is so that we, we learn end to end how to do this, right? How to work with international partners, understand how the software is designed for satellites, what are the problems, right? Uh, and limitations to run a computer in low orbit, right? So it's going to be like 500 kilometers up. Um, and then how to test it, how to build a clean room for that, right? 
how to integrate another module into this existing uh, CubeSat um, so that it doesn't impact the, the overall system. How to then like connect to, to radio to it. Mm. We have a ground station at Bosom that is going to work with this, right, with the satellite. I would say like the biggest achievement is exactly that, like to learn to these learn. basic things that we have never have access to. The function of the satellite is going to be, it's going to make some pretty much like basic measurements. So it's, mm -hmm. it has some measurement, you know, units on it. It's going to, like it might have a, a low resolution camera as well. Uh, we haven't decided it yet. It's, you know, there are some risks with it. But if we are able to send it to a low orbit successfully and then make a connection to it and basically communicate with it, uh, we would definitely think it's a success, right? Uh, what's what's more important is what's con going to come next, right? What's what's coming next, like the bigger and more powerful and more interesting satellites is. But you need to lay this ground, you know, right. the basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, like this, you cannot build something, you know, big from scratch. That's not mm -hmm. how it works. Right, right? right. I think this is one of the like most fascinating small corners of Armenia's ecosystem that that seems like there's a lot of interesting activity happening. And if anybody wants to learn more about this, they should go back and listen to our podcast with Nessa Sohanyan, who we really dove deep into the why space tech as an ecosystem and as a business area is, is really attractive and interesting. Um, and people should look out for Bosom's Facebook page to find out about the fundraiser coming up soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's starting August 8th, I August believe. 8th, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so we're going to try to make yeah. some noise there. Right. David, my last question. Earlier in the conversation, you said before Chris, you had an interesting life. You were working on cryptography and, and a bunch of other things. Why tech entrepreneurship? Why leave like traditional engineering roles and start building not just not just Chris, but being involved in Buzzwing and starting a venture fund and all these things. I can talk about the motivation. The motivation is the same. Like, you know, my dream is to turn Armenia into a technological, you know, country, right? That's so what, what motivates me. That's what mo motivates Arto, my co-founder, right? So I probably wouldn't be as motivated, like if I did this in the US, let's say, where I used to live. So, um, like, why entrepreneurship? Actually, um, I, I remember, like, I've never thought that I'll be an entrepreneur, right? Um, I, there, there was a period, like, of, of two years that I tried to do something, yeah, like, a, a product, actually, that was way before CRISP. But other than that, like, I haven't shown any sort of <laughs> desire to do entrepreneurship before this, I, the, before the idea of CRISP uh, arise. And I think it's usually a, a combination of different things, right? Uh, like, it coincided with us coming back to Armenia from US uh, with the it coincided with the idea the personal idea that I had about noise cancellation and the opportunity to make it actually a reality uh, with it coincided with meeting Arte my co-founder which you know we, we have amazing relationships as you can see we do a lot of things together right and then like meeting the team the, the research team, like the, the first sort of several people that were like uh, trying to do things with the, the noise cancellation here, it all created this motivation to get into this. And but once I saw all that, like one, one of all these things, once they connected, it was a, like a no brainer mm -hmm. to leave actually very lucrative job at Twilio because it was just growing very fast. So yeah. I, I left a lot of money on the table too. Yeah. To, to, to do this, uh, but no regrets. And you moved to <laughs> Armenia from the US to... Uh, yeah, in part yeah. Two. yeah. This is a really fascinating conversation, David. I could talk to you for a couple more hours on different things, so I hope you'll come next back time. one day. Yeah. yeah, next time. Thank you All so right. much, David. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.